Well, hi, everybody, and welcome once again to Unanchored Boston. And this episode of our show is brought to you by Our Best Foods, featuring Our Best Meatballs, which are available at your favorite local grocer. And by Cold Springs RV, your destination for all things camping. It's in Ware, New Hampshire. And yes, the yes. great George Gray at George Gray's Lexington Toyota. All right, Bob LaBelle and Mike Lynch, pleased to be joined by the great Karen Garigian of the Boston Herald. Bob, take it away. She is the Boston Herald. Uh, so <laughs> we'll be the Boston Garigian before too long. But I want to, uh, Karen, thanks for being with us. Thanks I noticed that sign me. says, Go Pats behind you, and that's your primary beat is covering the Patriots. But what a strange, weird, interesting trip it's been. Uh, and as Belichick, Kraft, Mac Jones thing is, it's just exploding behind the scenes. Or is it? What's, what is going on with Kraft and Belichick and, and Mac Jones? Well, if we go back a week and a half, two weeks to the owners' meetings, um, where both Belichick and Kraft talked separately. Uh, Bill was his usual self at the breakfast, <laughs> sitting at a round table with reporters. I saw that. Mike saw that, too. He was a jerk. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> well, I asked him specifically about the quarterback position because uh, at the end of the season press conference, he was lukewarm, wouldn't name Mac as his starter going forward. So I thought I would check back in on that, uh, it being April or whatever it was. And he, he basically made it sound like there would be a quarterback competition uh, during camps, during training camp. And obviously, you know, Belichick likes competition, but it still strikes you as odd, given they drafted this kid in the first round a couple of years ago, um, you know, given he is the s supposed future of the franchise, and also he was wronged last year with Belichick putting in two coaches who had never coached offense before. Uh, and yet Bill was still, you know, his usual noncommittal self with the quarterback. Then you fast forward later in the day to Robert Kraft, who couldn't say enough wonderful things about Mac Jones, how he loved Mac Jones, and thought uh, he was dealt of. Also, basically said there were circumstances didn't work in his favor last year, in that um, he thought that the addition of Bill O'Brien would help that situation. So that brings us to yesterday when uh, there was a report on pro football talk uh, that Belichick had shopped Mac Jones to f as many as four teams. So obviously it's like. Including Josh McDaniels. Right. Uh, who, you know, just added Brian Hoyer to his staff, who, who was cast out a month ago. And again, it's just hard not to connect some dots. And the dots you would connect are uh, Belichick didn't like Mac showing up the coaches, didn't like his whining on the field, throwing his hands up and doing this at Patricia. <laughs> like, you know, uh, he didn't appreciate that. And Based on the subtraction so far, Brian Hoyer being one of them, who, you know, it's been reported was vocal during practices uh, in terms of Joe Judge and basically saying, look, I've been in the offense you're trying to coach and this isn't the right way. So that type of questioning seems to have gotten Brian Hoyer tossed out. Um, and, you know, at the Patriots expense, you know, they, he, he's, he was due over a million guaranteed, but they cut him anyway. Jacoby Myers happens to be Mac Jones, best friend, someone who last year, you know, said some things to the media openly that questioned the direction 
they were going offensively. And I don't believe the Patriots made much of an effort to keep him. And he signed for relatively low money with the Raiders. So again, you start connecting the dots and news of, you know, Belichick supposedly shopping Mac kind of added up. Well, he didn't exactly endear himself to Mac Jones either. One by bringing in uh, Zappy in the third game or whenever it was and, and in front of Mac Jones and embarrassing him in front of the fans and creating that, you know, that S storm. Right. Well, the fans were, tra- you know, yelling for Zappy as opposed over Jones, making Jones the enemy. And then Belichick saying later at a press conference, he couldn't throw it 50 yards or he wasn't sure his quarterback could throw it 50 yards. I mean, that, yeah. he, so he, it, it cuts both ways. Both pe- both sides have been jerks about it, and I think both sides need a divorce here. Well, I don't. I mean, I don't know how you can expect. Again, this the slate should have been, in my view, the slate should have been cleared. You know, okay, Matt Patricia's out. You're bringing in Bill O'Brien. I don't know why Joe Judge is still hanging around, but he's not with the offense anymore. I think. At that point, it's almost it almost behooved Belichick to get together with Mac Jones and say, "Look, we both we made mistakes last year. Let's start anew. Let's go forward. Let's put our best foot forward. You know, let's make this thing work." Only I'm not sure that that happened. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> you know, whether Belichick actually, you know, shopped. Uh, Mac is up for debate. I think the feeling is that he, you know, he might have made some, you know, inquiries, let's say. Uh, You know, he might have talked to some people at the meetings, at the combine, just to try and get a feel for what Mac's market is. And some people think that that was just, you know, par for the course. He does that with everybody. But the problem is, is that given all the background and if that information comes out, it's damaging. So if he is, quote unquote, if he was shopping Mac Jones around, was he shopping for another quarterback or is he just shopping to get rid of him and go with Zappy as his quarterback? Or do we say the word, the name Lamar Jackson at all? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's the intriguing part. Because you would think uh, with two out of three last seasons, losing seasons, and an owner who has brought up the fact uh, that they ha- they haven't won a playoff game in four years, um, you would think there would be some urgency. And if that's the case, you know, perhaps... Bill was looking for an upgrade for his quarterback. And, you know, maybe he didn't find one. So, I, you know, as for the Lamar Jackson thing, I cannot see them agreeing to surrender the assets and, and fully guaranteed money for him. I just can't. So I, think a, I think that's a pipe dream. Because of the nature of the people that are involved. That, Correct. Yeah. That's why that's why I can't see it happening. So I, I mean I would be stunned pleasantly, <clears throat> of course. Pleasantly, because let's face it, this is a quarterback driven league. And the teams with the elite or better quarterbacks are the teams that are in contention. Or, you know, the teams that have very good quarterbacks with great surrounding casts. Do the Patriots have either one of those? So, That's Mike, if they were going to start the season tomorrow, who'd be their starting quarterback? Oh, it, it would be Mac. It would be Mac. I think I just think Zappy's being dangled in his face. Interesting. Well, he, he used to lose, you know, every once in a while he'd bring a kicker to kind of, you know, 
tickle uh, Vinatieri a little bit, or or uh, what's his name after him, um, Dostowski. And uh, I think he's doing the same thing with his quarterbacks. Yeah, that's fine. And the problem is, is there's not – I don't think there's a huge separation between Mac and Zappi, but Mac is better. Mac is the better quarterback. Um, so, you know, I think given what happened last year, given how well Zappi did against some really bad opponents, I think, again – Belichick has that as some leverage against Mac. The question is, why, why do we have to play all these games? Again, I don't, I don't know. Does Mac really need that? Wasn't he punished and abused enough last year? Yeah. You know, having a deal with coaches that he could coach. That's, that's all I'm saying. I, 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 I'm, I'm, pretty sure I know exactly what was going through Max Max's mind last year. And he was saying to himself, I know better than my coach how to get the ball into the end zone. My right. offensive coordinator that. Agree? Right. Agree. Agree. And again, people want to dump all over Matt Patricia, but again, he was put in that spot by Belichick. Yeah. You know, coaches can coach anything. Good coaches can coach anything. This, it's different with offense. And Mac, and I'm sorry, Matt Patricia coached the offense with such caution and safety and 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 sim- simplicity that they were just so easy to defend. And it just mm. frustrated everyone. They sounds to me like... Frustrated. No, I'm just going to say, it sounds to me like that philosophy that coaches can coach anything is was born in high school and is developed in college. And, you know, it's something that Parcells would have preached. You know, if, if you can co- coach offense, you should be able to coach defense or blah, 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 blah. But it was a much more less specific league back then. But then now it became a Dante Scarnecchia league where every position had a coach behind it. And, and now good coaches have figured out how not to coach everything. Well, and – Maybe Belichick can do it, but not everyone is. You know, I, I wouldn't. Well, I think maybe Belichick could do it. Maybe his father did it, and that's right. Maybe that's was that's where he got it. But it's again, you have to evolve. It's a different NFL now. Offenses are so intricate and complex, or should be intricate and complex. But there was a feeling in Foxborough that it got a little bit too complex with. Josh and Tom Brady, basically, you know, massaging it every year, making it more difficult, more complex to the point where receivers, good receivers couldn't function in it because they couldn't figure out what they were supposed to do. Yeah. And I think that's where the, the idea of Belichick wanting to simplify it, streamline it, you know, he's been wanting to do that forever. Uh, but he it would pretty much be stopped by Josh and or Skarnekia because, again, that degree of difficulty actually gave them an advantage over teams who couldn't figure out what they were doing from one minute to next. But they just went to the complete polar opposite end last year with just basic rudimentary <laughs> plays and Matt would just run them over and over and over and over again, where, again, you and I could figure out what they were doing on defense yep. and make a stop. Yep. But, uh, we're talking with Karen Garrigan of the Boston Herald among the many hats she wears, beat writer for the Boston Herald. And uh, we are brought to you by Our Best Foods. Next time you go grocery shopping, well, don't you forget to go into the frozen food section and look for a – Bag of our best meatballs. I know Bob has them pretty handy all the time. I have them. The smiling I chef in the bag. Uh, Pablo Bell, we've named him, and you find great tasting meatballs for your next dinner or a hot snack. There it is, right there. And remember, our best meatballs come in a resealable bag. So guys like us that are really kind of slugs can just seal it right up, put it back in the refrigerator, and it makes it easy for you to store away before your next meal. 
Don't forget right. to download the money saving coupon available online at ourbestfoods.com. It's so we did we see a bowl and I can't open it again. I tried to open it. <laughs> I sealed it and I can't figure out how to get back in. <laughs> anyway, Pablo Bell. I'll tell you that story. Have I told you that story, Karen? Which one? Oh, that Pablo Bell stupid story. Pa Pablo. What, Michael, we call him the chef on this. His name well, we call him pa Pablo Bell. Pablo what? Bell. Well, one year, one year at spring training in, in Winter Haven, uh, Bob went down with, you know, producers, cameramen. Everybody had a room except him. And because, no, I don't have that. The desk clerk kept saying, I don't have a room for Bob Lobel. So pick it up from there, Bob. Well, I said, you have to because everybody else has a room. And uh, would you keep looking, you know? She says, well, I have a Pablo Bell. <laughs> End of story. Yeah. That's how, that's the famous, it's a famous name. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Winter Haven. You, you'll be sorry that I know that story. <laughs> I am sorry. I am. Okay. I've been telling it too, too often. Right, here's, your, here's one for you. Okay. This is the last Saturday. I think it was Saturday. I'm sitting at Granite Links mm. in the bar area, tavern, bar, food, whatever. And the TVs are on, and the, the Rangers are playing somebody. I can't remember who it was. The Rangers were on Channel 5, I think it was, Mike, Saturday. Yeah. And uh, the Red Sox were on. And I'm looking at my watch, and it's like 4 o'clock. I said, what do I, what's going on at 4 o'clock? And I said, oh, it's the NCAA Women's Final. Caitlin Clark, Iowa, LSU, pretty. So I suggested, you think you could turn one of those? I know this is trouble. I know this is trouble right away because the bar's full. Okay. I said, you think you possibly could turn on the the women's final? Mm -hmm. Turn off the Rangers hockey. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was. But then the Bruins were coming on, so. The, this was a real generational gap here. I said, I really think the most important game is the NCAA women's final. I don't, don't ask me why. It's just about Caitlin Clark. You don't, do you know what's going on in the world? Do you know what the player this woman is? Do you know, you know, blah, 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 you know. And then there were some grumblings. And then when the Bruins came on, they took it off and put the Bruins back on. So I'm just saying it's, of all of all the things, I mean, I maybe it was me that overreacted, but I really wanted to see that girl play. Mm. I mean, she's pretty spectacular. Well, if you saw the ratings for the women's final, um, I think they trump just about everything yep. <laughs> on TV. So, I mean, maybe not here, but uh, all around the country, anyway. Yeah. It just. It just was kind of bizarre that it just was, you know, this society is facing up to what's going on in in the world, and it was right there at the bar at Granite Links, and I could tell that nobody in the world in the back of that bar wanted to see the women's final. All they were interested in saying was a meaningless Bruins game when the Bruins had already won everything they could possibly win during the regular season. Well, I have to say, you know, it it – whoever didn't want to watch and is a fan of basketball, it was their loss because uh, if you watch the Caitlin Clarks of the world play basketball, I mean, she brings you back uh, to times when basketball wasn't all slam dunk and everything else. I mean, yes, she's a, a big time three point shot shooter. I mean, she, sh she, she shoots from different uh, distances like Steph Curry, yeah. but she's also a very smart, intelligent playmaker, ball handler, uh, and a wizard with the ball. I wizard. mean, I, you know, I, rightfully I've seen references to her and Pete Maravich, you know, how she, you know, is able to play the game and has a feel for the game and handling the ball. And, she drew in a ton of fans and a ton of viewers because you really, I, I mean, while there've been 
quite a few really good women's basketball players. I mean, really good. She even took it up a notch. Yeah. You know, and, and again, if you enjoy the game or the game, how it was played <laughs> at one time, uh, it was really enjoyable to watch. And she's very unselfish too. I mean, right. extremely. She's, she, you know, she turns down shots when her teammates have teammates have better shots. Although the chances of her making them are greatly improved over anybody else on the court. Yeah, I, you know. And now sure. I want to bring up the one. I want to bring up one more event in that game was the the Allison Reese, uh, yeah, the LSU yeah. player, the disc. Yeah. What's mm -hmm. that? You know what I'm talking about, right? I do. Yeah. Great. I do right. know. <laughs> yeah, what is, you know, it was, I thought that was a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Caitlin had done it, the game, Caitlin Clark, you the game before, two games before that, to whatever team she was playing to. She so, did, okay. I, all right, then I take, I take it back. Right. And so Angel Reese was just basically returning the salvo. And again, me personally, I don't like that stuff at all. I mean, the men do stuff like that. They're big trash talkers. Um, but you know what? If the men are going to do it, the women are going to do it. And that's just and that's just how it is. As I said, I personally, you know, don't like that type of thing, that in your face thing. Um, but. I don't want to say it's an accepted practice, but it's what happens in these games. Speaking of, uh, of celebrations, what about with what's going on in Fenway Park now? Every time they hit a home run or look like they're going to win a game, we got a laser show going on in Fenway Park. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there are new lights. <laughs> they're new. Yeah, it, it got to be a little, a little annoying. It's like, okay, enough. Hit game After three. Game right. two, game three. Yeah. Right, right. It's like they were flat. They were showing off their flashing lights. No, I don't fan. know. Maybe fans like it. You better get used to it then, because if they started it, it's going to continue. Yeah. Right. It just won't happen that often. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any doubt in your mind that the this year? I mean, all of a sudden they've started talking about it, but the ball is definitely juiced. I mean, seriously, I mean, a number of home runs, and even Cora, you know, says he's never seen a ball this time of year fly the way these balls are fly. You know, I would my, I would say, when has it not been juiced? <laughs> I, I agree. I agree with you. When has it not been juiced? This I mean, they wild. want home runs. They want home runs. With all the rules changes and everything else, it's just like, how much further are we going to go? Except the balls this year really seem to be really juiced, not just juiced, but really right. juiced. Well, for a long time, they, they turned their back on and ignored steroid use as well. You know, Mark McGuire, they wanted Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa and those guys having this home run duel because it captured fans. So if there's a way for them uh, to, to spike home runs in the game, you know, they'll find a way to do it. Tell me about the lights, Michael, about Fenway lights. <clears throat> well, they're um, uh, the nice guy who runs, runs the show, John Carter. He, he was the video guy, and he's in charge of it now. And it's just uh, a, 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 it's like a laser show. I, don't, I, I read about it, and I, I, I've only seen it once. But I thought it was like peculiar that so early in the season, you know, it's like with like the seventh game of the, of the American League Championship Series. Right, it was you game know? two or game three. Yeah, it was all this flashing, like something. You know, how many games did they play? One hundred and sixty, whatever it is. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And already they're they're celebrating like they actually won something. It's, and it's it doesn't just, happen all the time, I guess. I, I know. So well, it's like Sweet Caroline, and it's like the wave, and it's all these other little gimmicks that you have at the ballpark that have nothing to do with the game itself. Right. <laughs> they used to be, they used to do a thing when the when the foul ball went out 
up, up over the backstop. And I go, whoop, whoop. Bob, they have to justify the cost of tickets somehow, right? Yeah. Well, they're still getting, despite finishing last last year and um, not looking to climb much higher this year, they're still, like, you know, school night, uh, middle of April, uh, early April, I should say. They're still pulling in 28, 29,000. Yeah. Pretty good. And I, I, I've always I've always maintained it doesn't matter who they're playing because I think Fenway is an attraction itself. And I think ownership has come to realize this. No matter what team we put on the field, no matter how much money we spend, you know, as soon as school gets out, we're gonna bang thirty five, thirty six thousand every single night. And on on odd nights we're gonna get to high twenties. Yeah. Well, we'll see how long that lasts. I mean, if they if they're really not good and have and have zero chance i think you like last season you'll see the the numbers dip you'll see lots of empty seats you know like toward the end of last year um so again if you don't spend on the product if you don't you know get the type of players that make you competitive if you don't re-sign the xander bogarts of the world and the mookie bets of the world uh, it it ticks off fans, and again, seats aren't cheap. Yeah. So it's going to make families think twice because it's not just the seat you're paying for; you're paying for the food and the parking and everything else. Hey, I'll watch them at home if I'm going to watch them. <laughs> so and, and the other thing, if you're going to start talking about the Red Sox in that way, this is probably the least interesting conversation we could bring up because they are I, I don't know if you agree that they are the fourth ranked team now in town yeah for sure yeah. Uh, but Chris Sale I mean it, it, if you're gonna, he's going to be like the, the guy to pick on because he's like the he is guy, he's got the one with the big contract and the least able to deliver on it and all of a sudden he's going to become the villain of this team if, the, if something doesn't turn around yeah. Well, it, it, as admirable as it is for him to continually fall on the sword and say how terrible he was and blah, 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 blah. Uh, at some point, people, again, look at the Red Sox should be looking at the contract they gave him, all the millions of dollars they've gave, given him. And I thought I heard something the other day that after however many years it's been, he, He's only had like five or six wins. Five, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> talk about busts. Holy yeah. smoke. Holy it's, it, it, smoke. It's, it's the worst. Con I mean, if you look at the Adrian Gonzalez, you look at Pablo Sandoval, and this may be worse than that. Yeah, it's it's up there if if not exceeds yeah. that. Well, I would even say exceeds, and the reason is he's a pitcher. And I know it's only once every five games, but, again, your number one starter, your ace, the guy you pay all the money to, and that's what you get, that's bad. Remember, Luke Gorman, uh, wonderful guy, and, and you – it was anybody pretty much who got an interview with Luke Gorman. I went in there one day and um, he said, yeah, come with me. My I, I got to distribute the checks first. Lou himself was going to every locker and putting checks, but he would open them and show me. He goes, here's, here's Clemens. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? He's getting? And Jack Clark was on the team at the time. He says, look at this. He, he opens it up. He shows it right to my face. You know, and I'd say, holy mackerel. This is like, uh, I think every two weeks they get paid. It's better than being a sportscaster. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to do the, the math really fast in my head, you know, without a without a calculator. But uh, yeah, it, it's it's the same type of thing. I'm like, wow. Anybody even knew how much money Jack Clark was making, you know, for what he's doing. And now, of course, every every contract is is public knowledge. It's all to me. I, I mean, it's all insanity. I mean, good for the players that they can make all this money, but it's almost like incomprehensible. Again, the millions and zillions of dollars at these. How'd you like playing a golf? How'd you like to be a pro golfer 
when you, you know, you walk away with, you finish 10th and you walk away with, you know, $800,000 in, in a week. It makes me think I've, I've got into the wrong profession, you know? <laughs> well, you know we all. We all <laughs> Which brings, my, brings me up to the next point, Karen. Yes, yes. This was a town that, what, had seven newspapers at one point? Yeah. So seven or eight newspapers. Think about that. And now we got two. Uh, and now this and, was a and town. It's barely, and it's barely two. <laughs> barely, I got you. No, I understand. We're all hanging on by the fingernails. And then the Sports Illustrated comes out with the article. I don't know if you saw it or not. Karen John Wertheim's article about sports anchors, local sports anchors. But they're done. It's over. The, the, uh, there are no such things anymore as local sports anchors that are, uh, you know, identify with the towns. Mm -hmm. That was a couple decades that it happened, and Mike and I happened to be part of it, right in the middle of that. But it's gone. It's over, uh, and it's it's no different. I think the three of us are in the same boat, and it seems to be sinking. Yeah, we're on a sinking ship. <laughs> well. I mean, yeah, all, not, just, it's not just the Herald, it's also the sportscasters of Channel 4, 5, yeah. 7, 25, you name and, it. And your station eliminated the sportscast. Oh, yes, that's what they tell me. <laughs> I know. At 6 o'clock. Unbelievable. I, I, how, but how is that even logical? Again, well, I don't know. Aren't we? Not, aren't because if, if Mac Jones were traded tomorrow, that would be the lead story at 6 o'clock. Right. So that's not... Yeah. Do it's they not, have, a, it's not a total they, elimination of sports. It's just saying, it's just saying that, sports is not important. Well, you know, maybe if you're out in, I don't know, some podunk town. Mm -hmm. But this is a major mecca of sports, all sports. And I don't know, have I missed interest dipping? No. In, in, in no. the local teams? No. So it's not just what the reason is this it's the cell phone you, it doesn't it's not a it's not a big jump from turning off the TV at six o'clock when you already know than what the news was at two if Mac Jones, were, if Mac no. Jones were traded it would be all over this right now yeah but also you know, it's going to be 70 degrees tomorrow and I, I don't have to wait till 620 to, to have, uh, uh, you know Dick Albert tell me so that's how. So that's how it that it's making sportscasters uh, irrelevant. Relevant. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, how, well, what about writers? How do writers? How do sports writers? Uh, you know, if if it's the Herald today, it'll be the Globe tomorrow. I mean, it's the newspapers are not the source of the news that they once were. Television stations. <laughs> are not the source of the sports news as it was. Uh, what, what, I mean, seriously, what? It's true. I can't argue. I mean, when I first started at the Herald, the circulation was up over 200,000. And our sports staff was well over 20, just the sports alone. And now... I think I would be hard pressed to tell you that the circulation is 50,000. It's probably less. And our sports staff has shrunk to seven, and, which means <clears throat> we can hardly cover the, the major teams in town, or it's up to one person to cover that team all year. I mean, it's just, That's you. well, no, I, I have a partner on my beat, Andrew Callahan. But our Celtics beats and our Bruins beats, which right now are two of the most significant beats, are one are manned by one guy. That's it. But you know, I'll be do I'll be you know given this is kind of the Patriots off season, although there's never an off season. You know, I'll be doing some Celtic stuff and maybe Bruins stuff. You know, as needed as I can. But there's also an NFL draft coming up, so. It's sad. It it really makes me sad, but it also makes me somewhat thankful that, you know, when I joined a million years ago, uh, it was an important and not irrelevant thing to be a sports writer or even 
Bob or you, you were significant people in Boston because of you delivering the sports, how you delivered the sports. There was an interest and a fascination in all of that. And people couldn't get enough of stuff that you would write in the paper. Uh, now everything's online, so forget the paper. But again, I don't think, I don't think the age of, of kids coming up, they don't even know what a newspaper is, but they don't know the significance of placement of stories in a paper or, or what, what the powers that be decide is the most important thing to put on the front page. Tell us how that works. Well, again, it, it's, you know, there's decision makers at the newspapers who decide what's the important news or what they want to highlight or want, what they want to feature. In the Herald's case, it's a front page and a back page because we're a tabloid. With the Globe, it's what's on the broadsheet and leads of every section that they deem to be the most significant piece of news. But I also think people reading, see, again, having a paper in front of them and looking at the news or having both papers just for the perspectives is so important and so significant. And again, it's also what's on their back page, what's on their front page to try and, again, I don't want to say influence, but it's kind of pointing out the things that people should be paying attention to. Mm -hmm. Now it's just like, web surf you know yeah. it's web surf and oh or just finding the place you don't have to pay for the news michael who was your favorite athlete that you've ever covered i'm gonna ask saint karen i'm gonna ask you the same question in all the years that you who who was your favorite athlete you know it's, it's funny he's in my top three um but the, the obvious ones would be bird and Tom Brady, but Marvin Hagler was up there for some reason. He was up there, and I just, I just love the fact that he trained at a gym above a hardware store in Brockton. Uh, that he was loyal to the bitter end with Goody and Pat Petronelli. He never got caught up in, in the, uh, you know, the whole pretty boy Las Vegas type thing. When he went to like Las Vegas, he didn't, he didn't train in the in the ballroom of Caesars. He went to Johnny Taco's gym which was behind a liquor store, I think, or a hot dog, and you have to, like, duck your head to get in. And it was really right out of, right out of Rocky. So he was, he was one of my uh, favorite people to cover because he, he, always, he was always very good to George Kimball, John Dennis, me, Neumeyer. And he said, you guys remember me when you couldn't even see my name in the print. It was so small. When, uh, when I was fighting the Golden Gloves up at Lowell. And uh, so, like, he, he would open his door after a world championship fight, and uh, there would be a million people waiting to talk to him. And, you know, Goody would go, uh, Mike, Bob, George, come on in. You guys come on in. They'd shut the door. And the four of us would have 15 minutes with Marvin Hagler all by ourselves. Um, so he, he, he was one of, my, one of my favorite people to cover. Karen? Well, I didn't cover him necessarily as a player but i dealt with him as an agent and uh my guy would be bobby orr and um i obviously grew up watching hockey watching orr and you know when you're a sports writer you try not to be in awe of anyone you, you yeah. cover or meet and that's and that's really important um, but I'll tell you one quick, try to make it quick, a story about Bobby Orr, um, that kind of sums him up. Um, and, and again, I was blown away by him. I was, I had just started covering the Bruins beat, uh, full time. And I was at the, at the paper one day and phone rang. I answered it as all early uh, reporters did those in those days. 
And the gentleman on the line said, uh, would Joe Fitzgerald be there? And Joe Fitzgerald was a former longtime sports columnist at the Herald. And I said, no, can I take a message? And he said, oh, can you leave a message to have him call Bobby Orr? <laughs> and I'm like, I, I was literally, I couldn't say a word after. <laughs> I couldn't, <laughs> oh my God, it's Bobby Orr. <laughs> and, and like I couldn't I couldn't talk and he's like hello 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 <laughs> and I'm like okay I, I I I compose I said oh yeah yeah sure Bobby I'll 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 leave the message and he said um who am I speaking with <laughs> and I spit my name out and he said oh I read you all the time wow me dead silence again like <laughs> hello hello <laughs> and then he said, well, you know, you know, I'd love to meet you sometime. Okay. All right. That was nice. I hung up the phone. Weeks later, weeks later, I am sitting in the old, old Boston Garden press box, which you know is above the, you know, right mid ice. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm in the press box alone, uh, writing my early notes. Then the press steward, you probably remember Frankie Vona. Sure. Uh, comes down to me where I am sitting and writing, and he goes, Karen, come with me. There's somebody th that wants to meet you. <laughs> and I look, I look down, and there's like nobody there. I said, Frankie, there's nobody there. And he goes, Karen, just come. So I, again, I walk to the end of the of the press box. And I'm looking down the steps, nobody looking around. Frankie, there's nobody here. And Frankie gets a chair, and then he points up. And I look up, and it's Bobby Orr in a luxury box, reaching his hand over <laughs> to, to shake my hand. So I'm standing on a chair now, <laughs> being great. introduced to Bobby. I mean, he made good on his word, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did get to know him after that a little bit and for like the greatest player, uh, hockey player who ever lived. I mean, you couldn't meet a more down to earth, not affected by fame type of guy. And so I enjoyed that relationship and also dealing with him as an agent. Yeah. 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 Well, I, can I tell you my or story now that she brought it up? Sure. <laughs> Did I tell you this, Michael? Drive, driving back from the Tucker Anthony to go. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's pretty funny. But yeah, go ahead. So we're at the Tucker Anthony down in the Cape. You know, it was at the, at the uh, Oars Club, as a matter of fact, is where it was played. The Ridge Club, yeah. Yeah. And um, so we're shooting, they were shooting the Tucker Anthony in the morning. And uh, Fisk was involved down there, and so was Orr. They both had to get, along with your, myself, up to Neshotic to play in the Pro-Am. It was the senior Pro-Am in Neshotic in the afternoon. And so I, you know, driving back, and so, believe it or not, I'm driving, and Orr and Fisk, are, I'm taking them back with me. So I'm like the chauffeur, okay? So I'm driving back, and we're – it's not lost on me who is in the car with me and I'm driving Orrin Fisk. I right? think about it. I mean, at the moment, I mean, it's like, you know, here's this kid from Ohio that doesn't know Jack about it, anything. And I got these two guys that are probably in the two greatest photographs in the history of Boston sports in Orrin Fisk and uh, blah, blah, blah. So we're getting, we're up kind of up about Braintree and, you know, conversations just was going along. I don't know what we're talking about. Obviously, we don't talk about relationships. We talk about golf or stuff, stuff like that. That's what guys do. So I said, I have a question for you guys. I said, if by some, you know, terrible circumstance, we drove off the road and were killed in a car crash, what do you think the headline in the Herald would be <laughs> tomorrow? <laughs> And Orr said, well, don't worry, you won't be in it. <laughs> <laughs> and Fisk jumped in. He says, you probably won't even make the story. <laughs> so, 
Anyway, that was that's my. I, I suppose my favorite was, for all kinds of different reasons, was ML Carr, mm -hmm. just because of his personality, and we did a TV show with him, and he was special in a lot of ways. But um, you know, there are plenty of others. I'm surprised he didn't say Brady, Karen. I'm surprised he didn't. I mean, Lynchy did, and I know you said close to. No, I didn't want to. I didn't want to pile on. So. No, that's gone. Pile on. <laughs> yeah. pile on. <laughs> I mean, I mean you worked with Orr. That you was obvious. Orr, you worked with Brady and all this. You know, think about Brady. people that are listening to this and saying, "How? How can how, she got to work with Orr and Brady, and they got to work with Bird and all? And she, you know, this woman did everything, and those guys did everything I always wanted to do, but." In some ways, it's kind of overrated, isn't it? What's overrated? Our jobs. Oh. Huh. Well, yeah, I don't think people understand the whole, the whole nature of our jobs. <laughs> you know, uh, long Why? days, lo long. It's like all day, every day now. Uh, there's no breaks because, again, because of the internet, news is constant. And yeah. you're responsible for it. So it's a whole different animal than it was, you know, when I first started. Um, but, um, yeah, Brady would be up there. I don't want to shortchange him. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but the thing I liked about him is, again, it's as great as he was a player, he always made himself available. To me, at least to me, I can't mm -hmm. speak for others. You know, if I needed something, uh, he would be at his chair at the locker and, you know, he'd always call me over when I kind of gave him the eye. And, you know, he, he was always accommodating and, you know, he treated me with respect, <laughs> which is important. Yeah. And everyone not noticed or notices or did notice how he would always address me by name uh, during press conferences. And again, you know, maybe that was a sign of my age <laughs> and being around the longest. Uh, but I thought it was also sweet that he did that. I mean, Belichick doesn't call you by name at the press conferences? <laughs> uh, there might be something he's muttering under his breath, but no. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He actually does on occasion. He does on occasion, but it, it kind of depends on the type can you, of work. Can you I tell am. if he's going to give you a good answer by whether he uses your name or not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, one time I asked him about, uh, I don't know, some, maybe it was something with the Naval Academy or who knows what I asked, but it was a question that he liked. And he actually said, yeah, that's, I'm glad you brought that up, Karen. So then he went wax poetic for the next half hour on who wow. knows what, you know, long snappers, whatever. So but must have been a Friday. Must have been a Friday because he's very, very good on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no carryover though, right? So that oh no, 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 no carryover no. between that question and the next and that press conference and the next question at the next press conference. You know, if you ask somebody he doesn't like, you get the stare, the death yeah. stare, you know, yeah. the, the death death stare. <laughs> Hey, let me take. Let me remind the, the, our, our our listeners and our viewers out here about Cold Springs RV. Yeah. And camping season is right around the corner. It's here. And if you're thinking about a motorhome or a pop-up camper, go visit our friends at Cold Springs RV in Ware, New Hampshire. At Cold Springs RV, you find a huge selection of the latest and new and pre-owned campers for you to choose from. If you want to check out the great deals today, simply go to ColdSpringsRV.com. That's coldspringrv.com. They are the best. On their they website. Take great just care check of out their website. Yes. You know, um, Brady has to be up there. You know, I, the, uh, when the Patriots won their first Super Bowl, they were staying at the Fairmont in New Orleans. And at, at the time, we had the coaches show, which entitled us to two rooms in the team hotel. Well, my room happened to be right next to the room Bill Belichick used. For his office. He didn't sleep there, but they for his office. So it was Wednesday of game week because they because 9 11, they didn't have two weeks off. Remember, they beat Pittsburgh. That's right. Brady yeah. sprained his ankle right. yeah. and they flew right to uh, New Orleans. So I come walking to my room and Brady's sitting in a chair 
right outside my door. Let's say I was 201, Belichick was in 202. Yeah. I said, I said, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm waiting to, to find out who's going to be the quarterback on Sunday. I said, oh, who are you waiting for? He goes, well, Bledsoe's in there, and um, I'm waiting for, you know, uh, for Bill. So I fiddle like, that, like, okay, I can't find my room key. I'm going to stand there for a half hour, man. You know, not, not my, 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 my door went open. And so finally the door opens and Bledsoe comes out, doesn't even look at Brady and just yeah. goes down the hallway. Obviously, this yep. Tom gets, stands up, looks at me, shrugs his shoulders and goes into the room. Now I'm running, looking for a glass to put against the wall, you know, so I could hear everything, blah, 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 blah. And I see him come out of the room and I said, Tom, Tom, what? He just gave me a thumbs up. I said, can you do an interview? And he said, not right now, but call my room in about a half hour. So I called him in his room. He goes, I don't want you to come up here. I'll come down to your room. He comes down to my room. And I know I had two queen-size beds, uh, you know, like, like any any other room. You know? He walks in and goes, wow, look at this. And he says, look at the ceiling. It's 12 feet high. This is unbelievable. And he's like a little kid. He's got a Red Sox hat on. And, and we did the interview right there. And, uh, you know, he could just blow me off and say, you know, no. And, but... I, I've always said the same type of relationship you have with him. You know, he calls me Mike, and um, you know, I don't ask for anything special, but you know, if I haven't needed anything, he always delivered. Yep. Yep. So there you go. I'll throw Ray Bork in there too. There's another yeah. one. Yeah. Or any hockey player. <laughs> yeah, <not> really. <laughs> you know, it's going. Uh, you going back to the final four? Go ahead. I'm sorry, man. Um, I want to go back to. Um, Belichick and Kraft. And I always said when I was doing the show that I, I, I watched their relationship. I always said that Belichick is two seven and nine seasons when he played 16 games away from Kraft taking, taking back control of the team. Have we reached the point right now, if we have a seven and ten, eight and nine season this year, could there be a parting of the ways? If this happens this year? I'm going to answer it this way. <laughs> In theory, yes. Um, Robert, since he's owned the team, has never had back-to-back -back losing seasons. He's never had been out of the playoffs for more than a year at a time. Um, so, you know, spanning his own. He thinks he's responsible for that. Well, of course. Um, so, as I said, in theory, I think any coach would be on the hot seat, you know, again, given the expectation here, both of the fan base and of the ownership. The elephant in the room, and that's how I'm going to describe it, is Belichick passing Shula as the all-time winningest head coach. Some people think that's a big deal. Other people, not so much. But I think it, it weighs on craft. And I think it weighs on craft because uh, the finger points at him, in a way, too, for Tom Brady leaving, so, semi being forced out, and then winning a Super Bowl with another franchise. I think Kraft does not want to go down in history as basically letting both the greatest player of all time and greatest coach of all time go. So I think, you know, in a perfect world to him, you know, Belichick will get the record with the team winning and then walk away. That's the perfect world. I just don't know if Kraft, while making these type of sort of threats, I don't know if he would deliver in the end for the reasons I just mapped out. Hmm. That, 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 that is a, a fascinating scenario. Um, and, you know, Robert has the Hall of Fame in his in his sights himself. Right. Um, and 
he, he's sort of uh, like Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman. He doesn't want to be liked. He wants to be well liked. Not yeah, well liked. Not like well liked. Yeah. I think was the line in, in uh, Death of a Salesman, and that's that's important to Rob. That, that's very very important. And that's why I say that's kind of the the underlying part of the narrative that yes, Bill's on notice. You know, because again, since Tom Brady left, they haven't done much. Yeah. We're now four years past Tom Brady, and mediocrity doesn't sit. Man, this team isn't terrible. They're kind of average. Yeah, right. Average, average doesn't quite cut it with Robert Kraft. So, but will he weather mediocrity for Bill to get the record and then have a, a mutual parting of the ways? That's the question, I think. That's the biggest question. Well, that would be the realization that it can never be the way it was. It'll never be the way they had it when Brady and Belichick were hitting on all cylinders. It must There has to be that realization that no matter what they do, it's just not coming around again. Not right. ever again like that. Right. But that doesn't mean they can't be competitive. That doesn't mean that they can't put together a team that that has a chance to win a championship down the road. It just doesn't look like it right now. It's going to be a long time, especially when you look at the competition. Yeah. Yeah. The division. This whole Aaron Rodgers thing. Uh, who has the quarterback? Yeah. Really? It comes down to who has the quarterback. Right well, now, what we talk about Karen. We were talking about the schedule and the quarterbacks yeah. the Patriots have to face this year. And Lynch, you know, if, you, if you just take a look at the schedule that they're, they're faced, I mean, they got every top quarterback in the league, either home and away, uh, from Cincinnati to Kansas City to, to Garofalo. Yeah. yeah. Every, you know, every, quarterback, every nightmare quarterback, you know, they got. The guy from Buffalo twice, you got the guy from Miami twice, and maybe Aaron Rodgers twice. Right. You know, every nightmare you'd expect that they have on their schedule, which could lead, in, with logic tells you in this league, that could be a disastrous year for them. Especially if you can't compete in terms of putting points on the board. And that's been the biggest issue for the Patriots. If, if a team scores in the past couple of years 25 or more, I think the Patriots are like O oh, and whatever or one in something. They just can't compete with the high-powered offenses. And while their defense usually is in like the top 10, it just never they don't stack up when the great quarterbacks come anymore. The great quarterbacks always seem to have a way of putting up a ton of points and then when that happens the offense, the offense is defenseless. They can't, they can't compete. They can't score like these high-powered offenses, and and that's kind of where they're at. They're good. Yeah, take a look at these positions that, yeah. compared to other teams. Uh, the skill positions, tackle, yeah. line positions, line line, yeah. skilled linemen, the left tackle, the right, you know, the, the guys that cover the backside. They're compare their guys with other guys, uh, other other teams. Not only do you compare the quarterbacks but you get you know wide receivers same tight ends you just go right down defensive backs they're not the elite of the league in, in any way shape or form no you know i won't even get to the punters how difficult is it to find a punter well, i mean seriously yeah or a kicker i mean we're they have a very consistent and good kicker but he's limited in range a lot of people have, have kickers who can kick it 55, 60 yards. Whereas Folk, you know, who's very good, he's very good from 50 yards in. Yes. But boy, if you, if you need a field goal from 55 or 58 yards, you're not letting him kick it because he can't. Whereas these other teams have kickers where – 58 yards is almost like a 50-yarder for them. Yep. And, that, and that's a difference. 
So I guess the legacy is everything to craft, right? Legacy. Yep. And I guess it's the same for Belichick. I was just going to say that. Egos are built in. They're built into the business. Whether it's Parcells, everybody thinks about their legacy. Yep. Whether it's Hall of Fame, whether it's Super Bowl ring, whether it's whatever. Legacy seems to be the most important driving force. Let me ask you this, Karen. Uh, and I know you've got to run, so we'll, we'll, we'll let you go. Um, does Robert Kraft step aside and let the blood or the dirty work be on the hands of his son, Jonathan, when it comes to Bill Belichick? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, <laughs> um, I think if, if Jonathan had been in charge, uh, Bill might already be. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yep. I don't know. I don't, again, I don't know if Robert wants that on, on Jonathan's watch either. Again, I think he wants some big, happy, get the record, and Bill walks off into the sunset, and there's this kumbaya that's a fake kumbaya. But you know what I'm saying. Everyone yep. is real happy, and it's a happy ending. And then the Patriots move on with Gerard Mayo. How short, how close are they to the record? How, what is it, 20? 19. 18. Yeah, 19 to break, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18 to tie. 18 to tie, 19 to break. So, I mean, if they is have. Is that the same number of games? I want to say, okay, you know, there have been playoff games or playoff games included. Does, has Belichick had more more game opportunities than Shula ever had? Where does Where does that even out? And maybe I, it's not a fair question until you did the research. Yeah, I haven't done the research on on you know how how you know how many wins Shula had and how many attempts or games. I don't know how many. I don't know how that works. I mean, if if Belichick breaks a record and does it in with five or ten more seasons, really, what's the record? You know what I'm saying? It so. Well, that's, the, that's what I'm saying. Right? You know, I don't. I don't think there's that disparity right now. Um, I, I think they're in the it's in the ballpark or even belt might even be less. So, you know, we'll see. But it's a good it's a good thing to look up. <laughs> you know what? I, I know what Shula, if Shula were around and what he'll say, he would be so pissed off at Mark Henderson and the snowplow that it cost him the one game here in Foxborough. That could have been the tiebreaker for him and Belichick. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> three nothing. That was the only 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 points in that game was a three nothing game. Three nothing. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry three. that I'm sorry that was cool. <laughs> I, I kind of like that. <laughs> hey, if you're thinking about a new vehicle, go where we go. Go see our friend George Gray at George Gray's Lexington Toyota. We've been customers for years because we know George Gray will treat you right. They're a family-owned, operated dealership that we trust, and you can trust as well. Go see the great George Gray at Lexington Toyota. Well, Karen, no, I'd, get, I'd get a new Venza, but go ahead. <laughs> um, this has been great. But the, the hours has flown by. Um, your insight is, uh, is, is keen, as they say. And uh, we, we certainly value uh, um, you coming on the show. It really, really, really it help, it makes us two guys look good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I enjoy it, and I enjoy both of you. And, uh, and, I, and, you know, getting back to broadcasters kind of becoming irrelevant, I hate that, too, because you guys have been so important during my lifetime. And, you know, I think it should stay that way. And unfortunately, it's going in another direction. Yeah, it is. Well, we're grateful. We're grateful we had our jobs, and we're grateful to have you on the show. How's that? All right. I'm very just recovering from... Uh... Rotator cuff surgery. Who is? Yeah. Oh, you are. Oh, oh can't really. Yeah. Uh, my my fastball's a little lacking behind right now. But, right. It'll, it's it'll your be... golf swing that I'm worried about. That's right. the one. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, yeah. are you going to be able to play golf this summer or not? I don't know. I, I still can't walk uh, without a without a, ro a roller. So uh, we'll see. Well, watch no. the Masters this weekend. Uh, trust me, I'm uh, I already pencil in four days. Every every minute of it, I'll be watching. Excellent. The, All right, Karen. Uh, thanks for it. Karen, yeah, the three of us ought to go out and play. That'd be some threesomes. 
Yeah. <laughs> some, guy in a, some guy in cane, guy in a wheelchair, and a woman that can't swing a club. Can't swing. <laughs> we'll figure out something. Thanks, Karen. Take Thanks, care, Karen. Guys. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Sure. Thanks for See watching. You later, Mike. Thanks for Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks for being with us, fans.